Why is there so much debt? Ten years before the financial crisis started, individuals and families in the UK had a total of £480 billion of debt. Since then, our debt has more than doubled. But who did we borrow all this money from? Was it from an army of grannies who have spent their whole lives putting money away for a rainy day? No. When you go into a bank and borrow a large amount of money to buy a small amount of house, that money doesn't come from somebody else's savings. It's just created out of nothing by the bank with a few taps on a computer keyboard. Sounds crazy, right? But this isn't some crime of the century. It's just the way the banks work. Here's how the Bank of England describes it. When banks make loans, they create additional deposits for those that have borrowed the money. Those additional deposits are just the numbers that appear in your account, which you can use to pay for your new house. In fact, around 97% of all the money that exists is created in this way, out of nothing, when banks make loans. Every loan they make creates brand new money in the economy, whether it's a personal loan, car finance, or mortgage. Now, here's the problem. If almost all the money we use is created by banks when they make the loans, then for every pound of money, there has to be a pound of debt. If we want more money in the economy, we have to go further into debt to the banks, because more borrowing from banks means more new money is created. But the process happens in reverse when we repay loans. When we pay down our debts, the money effectively disappears. This makes it impossible for all of us to reduce our debts. If we start paying it off, then the amount of money in the economy shrinks. Less money in the economy means less spending, and less spending means fewer jobs. So there's the choice. We can have either more money and more debt, or we can have less debt and less money. When the only way to get money into the economy is to borrow it from the banks that create it, then we'll always be trapped under a mountain of debt. But it doesn't have to be this way. If we took the power to create money away from banks, and instead have money created by a public institution that isn't chasing short-term profits, then this new money, as it supports jobs and the economy, could be used to pay down the debt. And we could finally start to clear this mountain. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for visiting with us this evening. I've traveled across half our state to be here and to see about this land. Now, I dare say some of you might have heard some of the more extravagant rumors about what my plans are. I just thought you'd like to hear it from me. This is the face. There's no great mystery. I'm an oil man. Ladies and gentlemen, I have numerous concerns spread across this state many wells flowing at many thousand barrels per day. I like to think of myself as an oil man. As an oil man, I hope that you'll forgive just good old-fashioned plain speaking. Now, this work that we do is very much a family enterprise. I, I work side by side with my wonderful son, H.W. I think one or two of you might have met him already. And, uh, I encourage my men to bring their families as well makes for an ever so much more rewarding life for them. Family means children. Children means education. So wherever we set up camp, education is a necessity, and we're just so happy to take care of that. So let's build a wonderful school in Little Boston. These children are the future that we strive for, and so they should have the very best of things. Now, something else. Uh, and please don't be insulted if I speak about this bread. Let's talk about bread. In my mind, uh, it's an abomination to consider that any man, woman, or child in this magnificent country of ours should have to look upon a loaf of bread as a luxury. We're going to dig water wells here, and uh, 
Water wells means irrigation. Irrigation means cultivation. We're going to raise crops here where before it just simply wasn't possible. You're going to have more grain than you know what to do with. Bread will be coming right out of your ears, ma'am. New roads, agriculture, employment, education. These are just a few of the things that we can offer you. And I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that if we do find oil here, and I think there's a very good chance that we will, this community of yours will not only survive, it will flourish. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Will the new road lead to the church? Well, that'll be the first place that it leads. Thank you, Eli. Anyone else? Well, if anything comes up, I'm pretty easy to find. You just come visit with me. Thank you so much for your time. If you have a milkshake, and I have a milkshake, and I have a straw, there it is. That's a straw, you see. You're watching. My straw reaches across the room and starts to drink your milkshake. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. This is the secret of how the rich keep us poor. Guinea in West Africa is the 10th poorest country in the entire world. This fact is shocking considering that Guinea is also one of the world's largest producers of bauxite. Bauxite is the main source of aluminum, the same aluminum found in cars, homes, and even in some of the foods we eat. So how does a country so rich in resources end up so poor? For the past 50 years, $400 billion worth of aluminum was produced out of bauxite that was extracted from one lone CBG mine in Guinea. Guinea's share of that wealth has been limited to a mere 1.2% because Alcoa, the company that runs CBG operations, refuses to let Guineans benefit from the mining operations. For instance, even though the government has authorized Guinean-owned Nanco Shipping to ship 50% of its bauxite, Alcoa refuses to honor this part of the agreement. This is all while Alcoa continues to ship Guinea's share and reap the financial benefits that come from it. In Guinea today, 55% of the population lives below poverty. Only one out of five households have access to electricity and a lack of vital medical resources leaves Guinea vulnerable to sickness as we witnessed during the Ebola outbreak in 2014. Guinea has an extremely high infant mortality rate because only 37% of children are vaccinated. This is the very same country that is one of the world's largest producers of a material that we all use in our everyday lives. Resource rich countries all over Africa are deprived a fair share of the wealth that they create. Over the last 30 years alone, the continent has lost out on more than $1 trillion. Today, Nanco Shipping is suing Alcoa for refusing to honor its own terms of the mining deal. According to Reuters, if Nanco's case were successful, it would mark a step forward for African nations seeking to wrest greater control of their natural resources from international companies. Please help. We economic hitmen have managed to create the world's first truly global empire, and it's basically a secret empire. We do it in many ways, but, but, but principally, uh, we identify a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil. Range a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. The money never actually goes to the country, it goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country that help a few very wealthy people but don't benefit the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or have cars to drive on the highways and yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay so we go back at some point and say you know you can't pay your debts give us a pound of flesh sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies vote with us on the next critical un vote allow us to build a military base in your backyard something along these lines and when we fail the jackals go in and either overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And if the jackals fail, as they did in, in, in Iraq, then we send in the military. I don't think the failure is capitalism. I think it's a specific kind of capitalism that we've developed. We've created what I consider a mutant viral form of capitalism. 
And this mutant form of capitalism, which I think is really a predatory form of capitalism, has created an extremely unstable, unsustainable, unjust, and, and very, very dangerous world. Uh, I've met a lot of terrorists. I've interviewed them for books. I've never met one who wanted to be a terrorist. They're desperate people. If we want to get rid of terrorism, we must get rid of the root causes, that cancer that is destroying uh, our whole system. Because I think it's really important that we understand today we cannot have homeland security unless we understand that the whole planet is our homeland. You know, this business is a business of relationships. Yeah, and everyone loved Marky. You are a cynical bastard, you know that? To reclaim the American dream and reaffirm that fundamental truth that out of many we are one. You hear that line? Line's for you. Don't make me laugh. For one people. It's a myth created by Thomas Jefferson. Oh, now you never go with Jefferson, huh? My friend, Jefferson's an American saint because he wrote the words all men are created equal. Words he clearly didn't believe since he allowed his own children to live in slavery. He was a rich wine snob who was sick of paying taxes to the Brits. So yeah, he wrote some lovely words and aroused the rabble, and they went out and died for those words. Well, he sat back and drank his wine and fucked his slave girl. This guy wants to tell me we're living in a community. Don't make me laugh. I'm living in America, and in America you're on your own. America's not a country. It's just a business. Now fucking pay me. The best things